All right, Ryan McGuffey. Before we get to our candidates, I think we should start with what Rick Hahn said in his closing press conference. And let that be our guide okay. to begin. So he said, quote, what he's looking for, what they're looking for in a new manager. Recent experience in the dugout with an organization that has contended for championships. Ideally, someone who is an excellent communicator, who understands the way the game has grown and evolved in the last decade or so, but at the same time respects old school sensibilities. So that is our groundwork to work with. You're smiling. <laughs> I'm kind of, yeah. Because, you know, I, I, all, I love that. I, I think those are great qualifications. I just think that uh, we've been surprised before. Yes. So expect the unexpected sometimes. I think this time it's more safe to expect the expected, but not so fast, my friend. Yes. This is going to be an interesting podcast. I think we've got some things to talk about. Starting with Bob Nightingale. Of <laughs> course. Bob Nightingale back again <laughs> with a report. Like two years ago. Can't quit you. Yeah. Uh, here is Nightingale. Quote, Chicago White Sox want to hire a veteran manager to replace Tony La Russa, not wanting to take a chance on someone with no experience. Some managers who fit the bill, Bruce Bochy, Mike Schilt, Ron Washington, John Gibbons, Bo Porter, Joe Girardi, Joe Madden, Bochy, Washington, and Schilt are considered the leading candidates. So, again... Let that be the foundation of our conversation, and we will go from there. But, it's a, it, can, I, can I add yeah. something here? Because I know a lot of people want to poo-poo Bob, and, and, and I get it. I do. But let's keep in mind, two-plus years ago, he was the first to report the Tony La Russa stuff. Mm -hmm. And I I mean, I know you, How we? I was laughing it off, going, "There's what? what is, why waste the breath of fresh air mm -hmm. on this report? And then guess what happened? There was a Zoom. We, we have to know that he's plugged in with the White Sox, whose ear he has, and I think this is a smoke and fire combination here. Mm -hmm. I really do. And I have some thoughts on some of these names, and we're yeah. going to get into them. But that's why, for those of you who want to just hit stop and move on from the podcast with this report from Bob, you got to kind of dig a little bit deeper, and that's what we're about to do. Yeah, and I'm going to say this about Bob Nightingale. If it was me, if it was – actually, I shouldn't say if it was me. I'm in a little different spot. Because they're not giving me this information. <laughs> if it was anybody listening at home, anyone listening, if you were given this information, what would you do with it? Would you report it? Hell you yeah. report it. Yeah. Bob Nightingale has relationships with these people, and they give him information. He's going to report it. So You're a national baseball columnist, Chuck. <laughs> for And you, you've been right a lot. You know, Even if you're right 50% of the time these days is... He is breaks news. Yeah. So I have a lot of respect for Bob Nightingale. So if you don't like him, don't like him. But when he talks, I'm listening. So there we go. Here are the candidates we've come up with. We're going to go alphabetically, Guff. And we're going to provide our odds. The odds of these candidates getting the job as the manager of the White Sox. I've got mine. You've got yours. We have not shared with each other what our odds are. Uh, but here we go. Let's start with Carlos Beltran, who a week ago or so ago, Bob Nightingale said he'd be a perfect fit. <laughs> so he keep might that be. in mind. He might be. He was hired to be the Mets manager a couple of years ago. He was then implicated in the Astros cheating scandal. He was a player. Um, so we'll see what happens. I just feel like He's going to Kansas City. I just feel like he was drafted by the Royals. Mm, that scares me. Yeah. I. He's a guy who I think is a great leader. He's a big clubhouse presence. He would be a good fit with this team. But again, has never managed before. Is that the right guy for this team in 2023? I don't. The managing before does not. It's not on my list. How about it, coaching? Hasn't coached. I, I want. Look. Carlos Beltran played for 20 years. Yeah. Okay. He was a highly sought after uh, free agent every single year. He, he, he At the deadline, that guy was traded more than anyone, and he always was going to contending teams. But that, that tells me something. Yeah. That tells me something about the type of player he is and what he can bring, not just on the field, but in the clubhouse, and why contending teams, time and time and time again, especially in his mid to late 30s, kept acquiring him. He, you want him in your clubhouse. Yeah. 
It's exactly the type of guy the White Sox didn't have in 2022. They didn't have that. There weren't teams calling the White Sox going, you know, we need these three guys to put our team over the top. The White Sox needed three guys to put them over the top. And they needed maybe three Carlos Beltrons. Now, look, I've never talked to Carlos Beltran, Mm -hmm. okay? I just know the type of resume he has and the back of the bubblegum card that Tony loved to say. I don't care, to be honest with you, Chuck, I could give a damn about what, how much a guy's coached or not. I mean, they pulled the Yankees pulled Aaron Boone out of the Sunday night baseball booth. How's that working out? Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, we know that Alex Cora had had a little bit of coaching, but these guys are are, are the, the recent trend of successful managers in baseball is player to player to manager. And the reason that some of those guys have success is not just because they're going to teams that routinely spend 200 plus million it's because these guys know how to relate to clubhouses in 2022 or 2020 or whenever they retired. And that's what I think makes them attractive is that those are the type of players as they got to the latter stage of their career who were the guys that younger players were leaning on, that veteran players would go to and say, hey, in game two of a series we trail 0-1, what should be my approach if I'm feeling a little much more, more pressure? Those are the type of guys. In essence, Chuck, what I'm trying to say is they were kind of managing as they were playing. So that's why I think... Now, look, there's been guys who have failed, too, in that same role. But I think there's been a lot more recent success of those guys than there has been failure. And the White Sox went the completely you know off the, off the grid and, and brought back an old-school Hall of Fame guy. Now, granted, he had been out of the game 10 years, and I think it showed. But I think there's a lot to that, that Carlos Beltran... Uh, could bring to an organization and will bring to an organization. Yeah. I don't think it'll be the White Sox. What are your odds for him? I have him at ten to one, okay. which ten to one on my list ranks pretty low, uh, as well. You'll see, but ten to one is juicy because it, it, as a better, you're going. You know, five turns into fifty. It's juicy, <laughs> and if you can get him now at this price before his name really gets out there, you know, I will say this: Bob floated his name. He did. So Bob floated his name. So that you know what I'm. 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 I'm as a better, I'm seeking advice, and I'm looking. I'm reading between the tea leaves, and the fact that he floated it, saying "perfect fit," it peaks my ears. But he was not on the second report. So. It was not, which is why I'll throw a little five on it. But right. ten to one is not good. It's, it's just not good for me. I'm going twenty to one on Beltran. Okay, I think he's more of a long shot. I just because I just also feel there's going to be a if I'm the the Royals, that's a Big draw for me. Uh, let's get a guy we drafted. In the history of, yeah. He's our guy. Yeah. He's our guy. We can't lose him. Yeah. That and there, there's a new GM. They want something new, and he represents that. So I'm going twenty to one on Beltran. All right, Bruce Bochy, three time World Series champion. He's won over four thousand games. Retired. After the 2019 season, did we call that retirement? I don't know if we call that. Well, I think people, people do, but I don't away. think people know the true, yeah. like, no. I, I think, you, yeah, it was a retirement. He got a send-off party in San Francisco, a retirement-type mm-hmm. party. We're calling it a retirement. We're, are we calling it a willing retirement? Yeah. And then you want to add to that? or you? I think what Boach, they got a new front office at the yeah. end of his tenure. Yeah. It was a front office that was a lot more analytical and brought in a lot more... Uh, the, the, kitchen, the kitchen had a lot more, the same recipes and ingredients, but a lot more cooks. And I think for a guy who had that success with those World Series championships, all of a sudden sitting in the same kitchen and looking around going, who are these guys? Mm. The approach was changing. I think Bo, like it was kind of one of those, this feels like the time for me to kind of get out while, while I still can. And the Giants at the same time could, you know, go with that new approach. And I think it was kind of a mutual parting that led to retirement yeah. than it was the other way around, which is why Bruce Bochy's name is being kicked around so much here in the last few weeks. Sounds like he respects old school sensibilities. Huh? It is. He definitely, <laughs> I, I appreciate you bringing back the Rick Hunt quote because he's, he is that guy. Yeah. So Guff and I did a little reporting on this so we can share something about Bochy, some things. Uh, it sounds like he's interested in managing again. Yep. He's looking for the right situation and that the White Sox are a possibility. And and that in the right situation, it's not a, it's not as much of a grind. Yes. I think that to me was one of the things that stood because the grind I think got Tony. Yeah. I think the grind 
wore on Tony for two years. And for a guy who has not been out of the game for 10 years, he's he, he's had... Now, look, let's not poo-poo the fact that he's had his own heart issues, mm-hmm. you know, Bruce. But He's 10 years younger. He's 10, 10 years, years younger than 10 Tony years Russo. younger <laughs> and three years removed from the game. Yeah. So he's been... He knows all of the all of the players that are in the game today. He knows. Yeah, has a relationship with probably seventy five percent of them. Right. If you are a player that's a free agent, or have played for Bruce, or that's attractive to you. Mm. Okay, that could be attractive to you. And if you're bringing in Bruce Bochi, aren't you like? There's always input from the team. I think with coaches. Like I think there's been a lot. You know, Ethan Katz worked for the Giants. He didn't work with. Uh, Bochi per se, he worked, I think, in the minor league. He was leagues. the assistant minor league pitching coordinator wow, in 2019, his okay. last year. So they worked together in spring training. Yeah. So yeah. there's familiarity there, and there has been some reports or rumblings that Ethan would be maybe the one coach that would have the the, the biggest chance to stay. Mm-hmm. But if you're Bochi, you're bringing in, you're bringing in a staff. Yeah. You're probably. bringing in a staff. Um, and the whole thing about the grind, one add add one more thing. If he's got a good group of coaches around him, he doesn't feel the grind. Mm. So good point, Chuck. Yeah. And here's the thing that this is one of the, the biggest things that we I was critical about Tony is that and, and Ken Rosenthal reported this in his open letter to Tony about kind of silencing his staff and support. And and which is why when Miguel Cairo took over, I was so surprised it was like, who is this guy? Why like right. why all of a sudden are we seeing this? And then it made sense. I don't think Bruce Bochy has any interest in doing that. Yeah. And and, and some people that have continued to talk to in San Francisco, uh, basically said everything that 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 right along with that that coach is coach, right? And he needs those coaches. Bochi managed Team France, by the way, in the World Baseball Classic in September. Uh, he is French, apparently. Uh, he asked Ozzy to be his bench coach, but, he, <laughs> but Ozzy couldn't do it because he was uh, working for us. He should have done it. It would have been awesome. No, he should not have done it. Come on, <laughs> um, Hans' description sounds it's- like Bochi. I mean, and I'm not saying that because, like, I'm not saying that means Bochi's going to get the job yet. <laughs> I can say that, but if there's, maybe we should list, maybe we should go back to Han's description and see who else fits that description. I'm not saying Bochi's not the only. I'm not saying he's the only one that fits it, but that really I think he's fits. the clubhouse leader that fits clubhouse, it. Well, yeah, yeah, clubhouse leader between him and Carlos Beltran, <laughs> or clubhouse leader of all the names we're going to talk about. I have him as the odds-on favorite in my list. Oh, you're just wow, you're going there. Yeah, but I mean, my list, I'm not giving, yeah, I'm going there. Okay. But I got some guys that are really close. Okay. I want to share something with you, with all of you, about uh, something that came across uh, the other day. So, culture, right? That's a big thing that White Sox need to fix. Is I think culture. it's the most important thing. Uh, and Bochi wrote this book in 2018 called Bochi Ball. The Chemistry of Winning and Losing in Baseball, Business, and Life. In January, he was giving this lecture, and it was to high school and college coaches. And I, it's on the internet, and I pulled it up, and I listened to it, and there was one thing that he said that really stuck out with me about what happens. Someone asked him, if there's a player who's on your team who doesn't fit in, doesn't get with the program, what do you do? Mm. And, uh, and, and here's what he said. You know, in our game, I mean, sometimes you do have to figure a way, and and that's by being up front or or I bring them in, and, uh, you know, it's not being confrontational, although it may go there, but, uh, um, you know, I've dealt with some some players who have been tough with other clubs, uh, veteran-type guys, and and I would approach him like, what is it you want to be known for? What, What... well, uh, you want to be known as a good teammate or an asshole? Yeah, what what is it? You know, and and put it out there. You know, just uh, just let them know you have it. Now, it gets to a point. I don't care how good the player is, and I've seen teams do it. And they tolerate, you know, a guy that just he, he's not with the program, and then he'll have a good game. And say, oh, we got we can't move him. We move him if he if he's that bad. How about that? We move him. I'm, is this, I'm done. I'm getting my Bochi jersey. Uh, the rest of this podcast is on hiatus, and I, I'm on the Bruce Bochi train. I, I like Bruce Bochi, the guy. I've had a chance to, to, to meet him a little bit. and uh, But that's exactly what they need. That's exactly what they need, Chuck. 
they need a guy who doesn't care about the talent, who cares about the he cares about the other twenty. He cares about the twenty six, not the one. Whether you're making two hundred million or two million, if you don't coexist together for the for the bigger picture, post for one sixty two and beyond, it won't work. You're either in or you're out. And I felt like before it was well, you're in because yeah. we can't do anything about the out. Well, the only person they did that to was Keuchel, but Keuchel was not playing well. Right. And that's a whole different thing. But That's what they need, though. That's yeah. accountability and leadership right there. And he's not sitting there telling you that I'm in the room every day watching. He's looking at a guy going, he understands that there's a problem here, so now he's got to go in He's got to go in and fix the problem. And yeah. sometimes the players can't police everything. And so you need that guy to walk in sometimes and, and go, what do you want to be known for? Yeah. Well, they're going to need, gonna work, they're need some players who can police things Absolutely. and well, him on top of it. But he also knows what is needed. And I, don't, I think Tony took this job thinking. It was thinking, already fixed. It was, it was in place. Thinking, and I don't want to be ripping Jose Abreu because I, I, it's not, not going to sound like I'm ripping him. I hope it doesn't. He thought Jose Abreu, I, I don't know, let me say this. There's a perception out there that Jose Abreu policed the clubhouse, and he didn't. He never did. This is nothing against Jose Abreu, but I think Tony probably thought he was walking into a clubhouse where things were being policed amongst the players, and they really weren't. First of all, I think the number one uh, thing the White Sox need in, in, in this offseason is a culture change, which means you need different players. Mm-hmm. One guy, manager, I don't care if it's Bruce Bochy or anybody else on this list, they can't fix the problem. If the players are the exact same, and you bring in Bruce Bochy, I honestly don't think you can fix it. They yeah. need to police the clubhouse by fixing the leadership within it. I also, to your point about Jose Abreu, don't think it's one guy that can fix it either. You need a collection of leaders, okay? You need two everyday players or two of or a bench guy and a leader yes. and and pitchers. The White Sox biggest leaders on their team vocally are pitchers. It doesn't, doesn't work. work. That formula regardless of new school old school will never change. You need everyday guys. Oh, we got to move that, on here. Yeah, uh, go. what what are your odds for uh what, plus Bochy? 150. Plus 150. So one and a half to one. Yeah, 10 bucks wins you 50. Wow. Yep. All right. He's my cl- and, and I will he is my he's my favorite right now. Okay. So I'm buying with Bob selling. Okay. And what we're finding out. All right. <laughs> uh, I got five to one for Bruce Bochy. Going okay. five to one. Okay. I could easily go down to three. Well, that might be another podcast. Okay. I could change it as the. Uh, I'm going plus 150. Goes. All right. You're, I'm, I'm going five to one, Bruce Bochy. And that was before I heard the quote. All right. Miguel Cairo is next. Easy. Han said uh, he will be granted an interview. Uh, listen, the Sox need a different voice, someone who's. One before as a coach or a manager, I like to see that. Uh, I think players need to come to spring training, and they've painted the walls. Yep, <laughs> there's got to be a whole new feeling. Yeah. Not every, I mean, there's there, some coaches can return, but I think the manager has to be different. So I say I got a hundred to one for Ooh, Miguel Cairo. Man, your odds are different. So my longest shot, he's he's my longest shot. Twenty five to one is my. Uh, it's only because there's nine names on here. Yeah. Uh, Twenty five to one. Uh, totally agree with you. I do think Miguel Cairo earned himself a job in baseball. I yeah. do think he will land on a coaching staff on a team because he's had success. There there was accountability in the, in the little time he was there. I, I was impressed with Miguel Cairo, uh, the coach, and I do think there is a place for Miguel Cairo in the game, just yeah. not the White Sox manager. Yeah, I just feel like this is not happening with no. Miguel Cairo with the White Sox. Next, we have Joe Espada. On paper, he makes a lot of sense, Guff. He's got Astros and Yankees in his DNA. He was a big part of the brain trust in the dugout with the Astros as their bench coach. He is still there. Uh, he was assistant to GM Brian Cashman with the Yankees. He's bilingual. He's interviewed for managing jobs, as far as I can tell, with the Mets, A's, Cubs, Giants, Angels, Blue Jays, and the Rangers. Mm. Now, why he hasn't gotten a job yet, I don't know. I did text Jeff Blum about him, our buddy Jeff Blum, who is an uh, an Astros broadcaster. He said, I love Espada. He's my guy. So he thinks very highly of him. Is he waiting in the wings for Dusty Baker? I don't know. Is he going to end up being... Actually, oh, I got it right here. He was Ozzy's third base coach with the Marlins. But is he going to end up going to the Marlins to be their manager? I say yes! So he's not going to the White Sox. I got him at 15-1. to Uh, I have him at plus 750, which on my list is tied for fifth. 
which tells like plus 750 on this list is kind of a longer shot, not as long shot as Beltron because he's more qualified for what Rick is looking for. That's yeah. what my odds yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My odds are what Rick is looking he's for. He's more qualified. I may take, I, I maybe have more interest in Beltron personally, but the Espada thing, how do you not? I mean, the Astros are exactly what the White Sox, cheating aside, that's put that in the rear view. Look at what Dusty Baker has done at, at the helm of this team. Yeah. They might win the World Series. They're a fan, they, they, they keep bringing guys up. They keep clicking. It's not just 39-year-old Justin Verlander. Valdez might be the best pitcher on their staff. They have more guys waiting in the wings. More than Verlander. They bring up, they bring up guys like Kyle Tucker. He becomes they're a They're loaded. Like, they get rid of Carlos Correa, and they win 100. They win their number one seed in the AL. Do you think that they, they don't care? They just – those are the teams that's I want That's a machine. To, that's what the White Sox – I don't – like, if you are a machine – Championships will follow. Yeah. Stop talking about the parades and stuff and build that sustainability where you can afford to let two hundred million dollar players go that you groomed that are twenty seven in free agency and still don't even miss a beat. I'm talking you like oh, they should hire a spotter. The, the, the a lot of interviews is weird to me. I don't know if teams are afraid to to, to jump on that. Astros I mean, you could thing. ask this: Are they winning because of Espada? They're maybe. winning because of talent. And so that, and so, good, so if that's the answer, then maybe that's why he doesn't get these jobs. Well, I don't that, know. That, that, that would be a team. Those are teams that are afraid. Then uh, I, I, I like, I like your thought about a spot of being the manager and waiting mm-hmm. uh, for the Astros. Certainly, I think the Marlins make sense. Depending on what you read and want, I, I just put him at a longer shelf. I'm going to go plus 750. I'm going to put a bow on it at that. There's no okay. more spot to talk. I think he's very attractive and will get a job. Okay. Up next. Ozzie and talk. All right, there's a lot to get here. All right, so what did he say on the postgame show a couple of times? Quote, nobody in baseball knows this ball club better than Ozzie Gian. And he's, I mean. You're right. <laughs> he's probably right. I mean, when he said nobody in baseball, he meant no one who the White Sox would consider as a managing candidate better than Ozzie Gian. On paper, I think he is the best fit for what this clubhouse needs. But it's not that simple. Now, Bob Nightingale's article did not include Ozzy's name as a leading candidate. How I look at Ozzy's candidacy, if we want to call it that, is I look at him as a wild card, as the wild card to this whole thing. I'm watching this whole thing play out from the sidelines, and I'm very curious to see how it does play out because hiring Ozzy to a small degree or all the way to a large degree has to feel tempting, tempting for certain members of the White Sox because of what he can bring. I mean, but this is not just candidate A. This is Ozzy freaking Gian. And there are layers upon layers of stuff that I want to get into about his history with the White Sox as to why it's not as easy as, hey, Ozzigan should be a, not only a candidate, he's the candidate, sign on the dotted line. Well, I think it depends on who's making this hire. I think it depends on, at the last second, whose voice is loudest, if it's all collaborative or if it's somebody who's just going to win out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Ozzy is the abs- he is the wild card on the list. In a, in a way that could shake up everything. Yeah. I have told you this, Chuck, and I've told Ozzy that I thought the right move for the White Sox would have been to pull a Philadelphia Phillies and fire Tony La Russa during the season and, and bring in Ozzy for this current for the 2022 White Sox. I thought this team is exactly what he needed. He would know how to come in there and, and fire up that team and get the most out of them. Would it have, have equaled 92-plus wins like the Guardians? I don't know. I do think that they would have played at a different capability level. I'm with him. I, everything that you just said, everything that Ozzy's, I agree that he knows this team better than any candidate. He, there's mm-hmm. no background that he needs. Yeah. There's no interview that needs to be done. He's been, you could say, studying the team for three years. He watches almost every single game. And as wild as and crazy as all of you people might think he is, he is a, uh, if you get to know him, he's just, uh, he, also, he's a beautiful person. Mm-hmm. I love Ozzy again because Ozzy Guillen will have his players and his organizations back. Because right now, he's got NBC Sports Chicago's back. He's got Chuck and I. He is a friend, and he treats you like family. And to see, to be invited into that is exactly a way to change culture. Ozzy has changed the culture of these four walls that we work in. Yeah, I could say that with 
at, at a time, to be quite honest, that we needed it during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. He would walk in here and light up people who otherwise were walking around not very lit up. And so that if I were hiring somebody for a culture change, Ozzy Guillen would be on my short list every single flipping time. It's why he's plus 250 on my odds. <laughs> I think he is the wild card. I think he should be amongst the betting favorites, and I think he should be stay there until the White Sox name their manager because regardless of an article or names that appear to be finalists, Ozzy is always looming in the back of the White Sox brass's mind. I yeah. don't care. Every time they have the conversation, Chuck, it's just, it just it finds a way. It's like, well, like Ozzy probably... So that's why I'm waiting. Until they actually have the press conference, my Ozzy odds are always staying near the top. All right. So I want to provide some background because say you're under the age of 20 maybe or you just aren't really you don't remember it or you weren't following the team i think we need to explain why ozzy and the white Sox are where they are and why this is a little more complicated so you go back to 2011 and there was friction between ozzy and kenny it was just there so ozzy's option for 2012 was picked up. He was already supposed to be there in 2012. But since there were issues with him and Kenny, he wanted a contract extension for another year. He wanted to be there for two more years, knowing that, and he'd feel good. At the same time, the Marlins were interested in him. There was a four-year offer. How that all came about is hazy. I don't know what happened there. So that was going on. Looking back, if the White Sox gave Ozzy that additional year he was asking for, he probably would have stayed. He could be the manager still to this day. I don't know. But if it, he wanted an additional year and it was not granted, that's where things get a little hazy. When the Marlins offer happened, things started going downhill. He asked the White Sox to be released from his current deal. He signed a four-year, $10 million contract with the Marlins. He left the team with two games left in the regular season. Um, I'm guessing Jerry Reinsdorf felt very burned by this, by his manager <laughs> leaving the team. Uh, now, it's a two-way street. I have no skin in the game. I'm just trying to put everything out there as how things unfolded. The White Sox asked for compensation for the Marlins. The Marlins gave the White Sox two minor league players for Ozzy. It was like a trade, and he left the White Sox. Here's a quote from Ozzy after this whole thing went down. Quote, it was my call to leave, and I appreciated the White Sox organization letting me do what I like to do and what is best. Maybe not the best. Maybe it's the worst. Like, Ozzy knew what he was doing here. Like, he got a great offer for more money, more years with the Marlins, but he was doing this to the people who loved him, and it was also a family thing. There was a lot of issues going on there. And things got bad at the end. Here's Paul Canerco. Quote, for Ozzy, I think he's been kind of just burned out on this whole thing and probably likewise on the other side. And that's how it goes. Sometimes in sports, a coaching staff or a manager or a head coach, whoever it might be, that kind of regime, regime runs its course. And that's what we have here. That's Paul Canerco. So I think all that needed to be kind of put out there. And here we are. 10 years later, they're looking for a manager, Ozzy. And I think Ozzy's even conflicted. What does Ozzy want to do? Does Ozzy want to stay here? Does he want to manage again? <laughs> he's come out and said his wife doesn't want him to manage. There's just a lot there. So yeah, I don't see how this is going to play out. But as I am watching all of this, um, his relationship with Kenny's gotten better. But to the point where they're going to be like, Ozzy's our guy and we're going to run this over again? I don't know the answer to it. That's why I put it out there as a wild card. It is a possibility. I would be, how do I want to say this? I'll say it, I'll put it this way. If this, if Ozzy's candidacy was a street light, it, I don't see a red light. I don't see a green light. I see a, 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 a yellow light. Yeah. I see a, a flashing yellow light to just be like, this could be a possibility, or then again, it may not be at all. Yeah. So, you know, you bring up 2011. It's not just that. It's 1997. Okay? 
It's when Mike Caruso is going to be the guy who replaced Ozzie Guillen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and Ozzie left. He wanted to play his whole career. When you have when it's family, it's different. Ozzie has been in, in the family for 40 years. This is not just a manager. Yeah. Did he burn? Here's where, here's where I'm at on the 2011 thing. Uh, I think Ozzie's different man today than then. I think he's learned a lot about how to say, like what to say, when to say it, and when not to. Um, That's a good point because of all the television that we've been doing. Yep. And social media has changed. Yeah. yeah. And so Twitter didn't exist when he was the White Sox manager. And it, 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 it kind of did. It started to. In 2009. Oh, that's and, right. Yeah, 2009, I mean, but, 2010. But, but nothing like, like it is today. I'm thinking about like old fire or five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing like it is today. And in fact, he got burned by that because of, uh, of, of what he said in Miami. And... I, I, I know and talking to him and, and knowing yeah. him like you do. I, I just things are, are different. If if grown men can't get together and let something that happened, you know, we all have somebody in our life or something that, you know, you probably wish you wouldn't have said or wish you wouldn't have done or, and you like to go back and repair it. This isn't even about repair. Because Ozzy's all he's back in the family. He's thrown out first pitches. He's he's been embraced by the like the fan base. Whether they want to or not, he's part of the family every single day he walks on our television station. So he's been granted permission to come home. Does well, he get the yeah. full does he get the <laughs> yeah. does he get the ultimate key? Yeah, yeah. That's and the, I that's think the I do think probably that's the caution. I, I that's a great analogy. I think it is a caution light. Mm-hmm. And I think there are people who are are there people willing to because Tony Tony LaRusso was probably uh, to a lesser degree uh, uh, less of a caution light, but still caution. And can they, they need to get it right. They, mm-hmm. they can't let this fail again. And I think that might scare some. And quite frankly, Chuck, you need to be, you can't always feel 100% confident. You need to be a little bit scared. And I do think Ozzy would be a great fit for this team. Mm-hmm. And, and what this, I don't, and I'm not talking about 2020. Seven or eight, how many years? I don't know, you know. But for what the what's left in this competitive window, I think Ozzy Guillen would fit most of the criteria that Rick Hahn provided. Yes, yes. So, so uh, what am I saying here? So I'm not. My odds are not like yours. You're you're at like one and a half yeah. to one and two and a half. So I've got Bochi at five to one. Okay. I got Ozzy at six to one. All right. So you, I mean, in essence, they're the same. Yeah. I have one fifty and two fifty. Okay. So you put so we are both thrusting Ozzy into the yes into, I put him in there even yeah. though Bob Nightingale does not have him as a candidate just from what I know of Ozzy um, and I know I'll say this I'm gonna cheat the cheat sheet yeah. Ozzy a, has has a better odds than uh, Ron as great as great or better odds than Ron Washington or Mike Schilt on my list Wow okay 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 uh, let's fly through the next few yeah. Uh, <laughs> my apologies to Freddy Gonzalez. Uh, born in Cuba, he's bilingual. Managed the Marlins from 07 to 2010. Managed the Braves from 2011 to 2016. Won division title in 2013. Got fired in 2016. Started the year 9 and 28. That's why he got fired. Uh, he's Brandon Hyde's bench coach in Baltimore. Um, in April, he was asked if he wants to manage again. He goes, yes, I do. The only reason for me is I didn't like the way it ended in 2016. And he got fired. Here I am, playoff manager, a couple of runners-up manager of the year, and I'd like to get an opportunity. I think I'm better off now after spending six years learning that analytics and what's important and not important than it was back in 2014 and 2015. So I think he's someone who like needed to get a kick in the rear. He wasn't just he had a, he had some growing pains. He had to learn some stuff. He spent six years kind of not in that big chair, and he's been watching. I think whenever he gets another chance, he'll be a much better manager. He's a good fallback plan for the Sox. Fall black, fall back plan, I got him at 10-1. to 1. I got him at 9-1. to 1. Okay. I don't have a lot more to add. I just don't think he's the guy for this team right now. I'm not yeah. saying he, he might be a great manager for someone. Right. I just, for what this team needs, this he might have been a better answer after Ricky. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's a better answer after Tony. Ah, Okay. All right, we get, uh, let's get to Willie Harris. He interviewed for the job that went to La Russa, one of the few that got an interview. 
Uh, he told our Gordon Whitmire, I think I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I've checked all the boxes, went through the minor leagues. I've done everything. My resume speaks for itself. I feel like I'm ready for the opportunity. Now you just have to wait. David Ross told Whitmire, he's got a lot more experience than I did when I took this job. Marcus That's Stroman fair. retweeted a video from our White Sox talk account of Rick Hahn describing the team's performance this season. He's like, disappointing, disaster, whatever he said. And Stroman goes, Willie Harris needs that manager job next year. <laughs> Absolute legend who is well-respected in the game. Perfect man for the position, exclamation point. Marcus Stroman on one of his own coaches, just putting that out there. I know Willie. He's got a great eye for things in the clubhouse. Uh, he knows what to say, who to say it to, when to say it. He knows the White Sox. He managed Winston-Salem for a year. He managed Aloy Jimenez when he was there. Uh, when we're talking about Bochi, Ozzy, and we're going to get to Mike Schilt and Ron Washington, if you have a chance to get one of those guys, in my opinion, you get one of those guys, and you make Willie Harris your freaking bench coach, and you are rolling. You are rolling. So that's what I think. That's exactly what I have. Yeah. Willie Harris is my bench coach. Yeah. And if I'm Bruce Bochi, boom, I pop him right on the bench. Because what... Here's what Willie was. He was a career group four. Group four was yes. that group, that Jeff Blum group. They loved Pablo Zuna. They identified as being those guys off the bench that had a role. But also Willie Harris was, was a glue guy. Yes. He was a glue guy. And that's what I'm talking about. You need leadership needs to come from different people, not the $200 million guy that's going to have a statue, or in this case, Jose Abreu, who accumulated $200 million. You don't always turn to the best player to be the biggest leader. Paul Konerko was a captain. Paul Konerko led by example. Okay, Ozzy was leader. Ozzy was a player. Ozzie he was their worst he hit, player. He hit ninth. If their worst player is a Gold Glove winner that okay, goes to the All Star game, worst hitter. Worst hitter. Ozzie, yeah, worst hitter. Ozzy's hard on himself sometimes, but he's a damn good player, and it's yeah, why he was, played I fifteen plus years. We're worst hitter. Willie Harris is in the game because he's worked his ass off to stay in it. Yeah, and he's commanded a ton of respect in order to do it. I love Willie. I I, I liked Willie. I went down to Winston Salem when he was managing that team. Talked to him when he was with the Cubs earlier this year uh, when we were out there for Crosstown. Mm -hmm. The guy bleeds baseball. He would be phenomenal, and I think will be a phenomenal manager. Again, like you said, Chuck, you're talking about some big-time names here. Yeah. So make Willie – so I want a, I want a big-time staff. Yes. I, I, I. It's not one guy. This is a much – this is a collective group. If you're telling me Willie Harris is on the staff of one of these other names – then get it done. You know what? And if it's, say it's Ron Washington, say it's Bruce Bochy, you're grooming Willie Harris to be the manager. That's what, it, you want to be a machine, right? Yeah. We're talking about Espada possibly being the manager in waiting. That's what a machine is. You not only have talent on the field, yeah. your coaching staff, it's like, well, it's Dusty's going to retire. That's cool. we got four other guys that can manage. We'll yeah. just, whoo, whoo. That's a machine. Yeah. A machine is front office, coaching staff, Players, right. boom, boom, boom. So I got Willie at fifteen to one. I got him at ten to one. Okay, uh, I've got two more candidates here. I think we're going to talk about. And I will throw a few names after that. Mike Schilt. This is an interesting guy to me. He spent eighteen years in the Cardinals organization. His first year as full time manager with the Cardinals won the NL Central, lost to the Nationals in the NLCS. He was the National League Manager of the Year. First year as manager. Took the Cardinals of the wild card round in 2020 and 2021. In 2021, remember, they won 17 games in a row, franchise record. They went 22 and 7 in September. He was nominated for manager of the year, and he was shockingly fired after the season for what was described as philosophical differences. All right, so I found this in USA Today. His quote is saying, about getting fired, I never thought it was a possibility. It hit me like a ton of bricks. He apparently, not apparently, he did this. He walked upstairs to tell his wife that he got fired. She didn't believe him. She thought it was a joke. It took him several minutes for him to convince her that he was actually fired. <laughs> I was surprised. Uh, they finished yes. five games behind the Brewers. Manager Craig Council, quote, I was shocked, completely shocked. That's the way I can say it. After he got fired, the first three calls came from Yadier Molina, Paul Goldschmidt, Adam Wainwright. Joe Madden called him. 
Terry Francona shook his hand, told him he'd be back. Bruce Bochy had dinner with him in Nashville, Tennessee. Tony La Russa heard from someone in the Cardinals organization that he was fired because of a quote-unquote toxic environment. La Russa is quoted in March, spring training, is February or March. So someone went to Glendale, asked La Russa about this. I, I remember someone doing this. And this is La Russa. On, this is, the best quote of the year from Tony La Russa is in this article in USA Today about Mike Schilt getting fired. Quote, that one frosted my ass. <laughs> Tony La Russa on this. My comment was that if it was toxic, it must be in the front office. La Russa saying this. I'm for the Cardinals. Everybody makes their own decision. But when you start talking about that, that it might, it might damage Schilt's chance to manage again for those that don't know any better. He did a hell of a job. Philosophical differences? Okay. But toxic? A toxic environment? Larissa goes, he's a special guy. That's why it's so important for his reputation to be intact and not smeared. So this is what Tony Larissa thinks. Do you think he might say to Jerry Reinsdorf, hey, just so you know, I'm a big fan of Mike Schilt. And would that carry weight? It's my biggest fear. <laughs> Being dead serious, <laughs> yeah. And I, I, Mike Schilt. If you remember, I think it was the sticky, the sticky stuff st yes. situation yes. happened in Chicago, yes, in 2021. And I really, uh, I've gained I, a lot of respect. I gained for a him. ton of respect. His post game press conference. I was like, this is a dude. Yes. Now, look, those those names that you read that re that reached out in support of ours are, are respect. I mean, hell, we're talking about half of them. I want, I want all of them. Yeah, I want Molina, Goldschmidt, Wainwright, I want Madden, those kind Francona. Of, well, I want OG. those type of leaders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do. I, there's a reason he got fired. Maybe somebody just wanted him out. I, I don't. We don't know. You know, toxic is a pretty strong word. Yes, it's the anti of what the White Sox need right now. Uh, but Something tells me he's whatever happened. He learned from it. But it, whether it's his fault or not, agreed. I mean, I think he was a candidate for the Padres, Padres job last year. He's now their third base coach. Now their third base coach. So he's still in the game, still in the playoffs. I, I, I do. I am concerned about the weight of the conversations. I am. Why wouldn't you be concerned about Tony La Russa, who didn't want to leave, is now giving input into... Oh, well, I'm not saying he is. Well, I'm just saying he could be. Why wouldn't he be? Tony cares about this organization. Right. He, cares, he's a, he cares about these players. Well, well I mean... The, the, if Tony just says this and they go, oh, you, you like him? We'll hire him? That, that's not, they're not going to do that. There's no way to like, oh, Tony, this is what you recommend? Then we were not gonna, we're not going to talk to Bruce Bochy. We're not going to talk to this person. You think they would do that? You do. Jeez. Wow. Guff. I didn't, did I say anything? Uh, well, you, you said it a lot with what you did say. Right. I think, you want to know why Oz end up, you end up with, why is my wild card? Why? It's because I think everything's on the table. Because yeah. we've seen it happen before. Okay. And tell me, tell me I'm wrong until you can actually tell me I'm wrong. I can't tell you you're wrong. That Tony's voice wouldn't carry weight in a manager conversation? He didn't get fired. No, but I, I don't think he's going to say higher than him. I say I, he Tony, might, might, Tony might submit a list and go, here. If, I were, if it were up to me, I would hire these three guys. Right. You guys make the decision. That's okay. I have nothing wrong with that. Oh, and honestly, wrong. if if Mike Schilt is the guy, I'm not going to be oh, no, so his, upset about it. No, no, Look no. what I just said. Yeah, the guy's like he's played. He's bad. He's managed three times, and they won 90 games all three times. I think it was 90. I'm not shitting made the, on made Mike the Schilt, the playoffs even though it sounds like I am. I just am concerned about. Again, this is all about. He's 54 years old. He actually kind of checks the boxes. He checks I want. a lot of boxes. And I've I've seen his post. I, some I want to know about the toxic comment that was made. Who? What toxic? But you know, right? Well, he someone if, said if that those are the guy. Paul Goldschmidt, who's the MVP of the league, is reaching out saying like this is BS. Adam Wainwright, Yadier Molina. Yeah. Uh, you know what? This is some phone office person who doesn't <laughs> uh, who thinks something that Yadier Molina, Paul Goldschmidt, Adam Wainwright, Joe Madden, Terry Francona, and Bruce Bochy disagree with. So yeah, so I'm siding that, with Mike Schilt. I have Mike Schilt at th three to one. Three to one. Okay, yes. and I'm at six to one. So, so I'm, not, so I'm yeah. not putting him at ten to one here. I'm putting him as I got him as a favorite. I got him so. tied with Ozzy Guillen. I have Ozzy. Ozzy's my number two, but okay. uh, Schilt. Uh, I, I have okay. I'll, I have a plus one fifty. I have two plus two fifty, and I have Mike Schilt at three. All right. We got to talk about Ron Washington. Ron Washington. Won 90-plus games with the Rangers in four straight years. 
2010 and 2013. He won two pennants with the Rangers. Should have won a World Series. How about this for irony is what we're talking about here. In the World Series, in 2010, he lost to Bochy's Giants. In 2011, he lost to La Russa's Cardinals. So, all right. I asked, so, I asked someone with the Braves about Ron Washington. Here's what I heard back. Quote, Ron is a legend. Guys swear by the daily work they do with him. They call it wash work. You ask any infielder about him, and they start gushing. Nothing matters more to him than what positive impact he leaves behind in this game. People would love to see him get another shot, but would hate to lose him too. Mm. He has worked with Marcus Simeon's defense, Austin Riley, Dansby Swanson, Elvis Andrews. Uh, he's a third base coach. They had a bobble day, bobblehead day for him when he was a third base coach with the Braves. So, I mean, if that doesn't tell you everything you need to yeah, know, yeah, like this is a guy. He's now he's going to be seventy-one in April. So uh, the age thing does. Okay, like, I'm just throwing. I'm I just know saying that he's uh, seven years younger than Tony La Russa. Yeah, but he's been in the game. Every like he's not this. This yeah. guy is in the game with a championship organization. Right. Here's what I see with him: his candidacy and Ozzie Guillen's. These are redemption mm. hires. Uh -huh. He is looking for redemption because what I hadn't gotten to is so he in 2009 he tested positive for cocaine. So that's out there. In 2014 he had some family issues, resigned in 2014, has not managed since. Infield and third base coach with the A's. He was a finalist for the Braves managing job in 2016. He's been a third base coach with them since and been their infield coach. This is a baseball lifer. People love him. And I could see him like, this is my redemption to get back. Cause a lot of people wondered, would he ever manage again? Just like Ozzy. I have him at my sec. I have him at, with Ozzy at plus two fifty. Okay. I love the story. Yeah. Is he human Chuck? Are you asking me? Yeah. Is he, oh he's yes. Human, he's, right? hum he's human. So he's, We've made mistakes. Yes. He's made mistakes. None of them, like, whatever. I'm not going to but the, the, we are 2009, 2014. Those are personal mistakes that impacted probably people who are closest to him and it lost him jobs. Yeah. He didn't lose him his career in baseball. The guy has given everything to the game and to, to me, the players that matter in the game. And look who the organizations are that keep hiring him. Mm -hmm. Look at, look at, look at their, yeah. look at their success. You know, he was with Oakland, but when Oakland was pumping. Yeah. You know, and then where's he go? Atlanta. Atlanta might they're 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 as model of a franchise right now as any model in baseball, so you don't think he's around the the gut of uh, he's got the bright the snicker thing which I guarantee you like they have a little bit of gut they have all of the analytics yeah they're a front off they're four you know what he is he's all the little things he's all, he's all little things you watch when or you don't see with the White Sox Ron Washington represents the little things I love guys like, and, and look Rick says last ten years well he's in the World Series in two of those okay. Yeah. In the last ten years, so what I love about Wash is that, and there's a lot of guys on this list. Freddie Gonzalez is another one. Guys who have learned from their past, whether mm -hmm. it be mistakes made or things that got them fired, and now they've still learned in the game. I love Wash because I've talked to guys who've played for Wash, mm -hmm. and to me, he's like the he, he is the coach version of Johnny Cueto running the stairs. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's looking, look at look at Johnny Cueto. Where's the other twenty five guys? None of them are with Johnny Cueto. Watch infielders train with uh, Ron Washington. He's got outfielders taking infield because he works so hard, and he's a man of routine and principle and wants the best in people. Like, that's culture, Chuck. Yeah. Like, it's it's the number one free agent acquisition the White Sox can make, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best player. They need leadership in this damn organization, and they need leadership in this role, and they need leadership to come probably in three different acquisitions in the player. Yeah. And Ron Washington is at plus 250 for me because I think he embodies a lot of that. So I have him at 5 to 1. I have him tied with Bochi as a front okay, as, as the front leader. as the front runner. Yeah. Him and it's, so our list in essence is very the similar, same. Yeah, just you, different odds. Yeah. I'm going to shop at your book to be honest with you. I get <laughs> yeah, you get more money in my book. <laughs> Come to Chuck Garfine's casino. Wait, Chuck Garfine's giving away money. The favorite exactly. 5 to 1. <laughs> um so I, 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 I'm just looking at this. If the Sox get either 
Bruce Bochy, Ron Washington, Mike Schilt, or Ozzy freaking Gian. I'm loving it. If we can get one of those four in there, that's a win, 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 win situation for the Sox. Is it going to happen? I don't know. But that's where this feels like it's headed to me. That would be win number one of the offseason. And because I've seen, and, and Ozzy's probably the guy on the list, people are like, well, he's not in the game. He, yes, he is. By being in front of the camera, you're in the game. And if you've ever seen Ozzy like we do, when he goes to the ballpark for a show mm-hmm. and the flock yeah. of, of, of players from both teams who are yeah. playing that day come over to him, tell me he's not in the game. And I'll call your bluff every single time of the week. I'm with you, Chuck. I'm, the, uh, there are a couple things on that list from Rick that I absolutely love, but I do think at this stage, this is what they need. They need accountability and leadership, and these names that we just discussed have a lot of that. Okay. So we will see what happens. We hope you. we have provided some information and context. Oh, what else? So you you're there? saying the field at oh, 25 field. to 1 on my list is ha- has a chance, and I would say yeah, I mean, it has a chance. We haven't talked about Joe Madden, Joe Girardi, A.J. Przinski, Jim oh. Tomey. I mean, there's all sorts of names we could throw out there, but I'm, I wanted to get into some realism. Now, the field could be realism in the end, at the end I of the day. That's why I put it on my list. I have right. I mean, we don't know how this is going to go, um, but uh, where things sit right now, I, I feel um, comfortable. Is that comfortable is the wrong word. I, I feel like this is, there's some realism in what we're saying here. Smoke. This is going to yeah, fire. yeah, yeah. I mean, because you never know where it's going. But as this, there's a lot to be determined, though. You know, I mean, Schultz still in the play. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff brewing going right, on. Right, right, right. I mean, mean, Washington's still in the playoffs. So yeah, and I mean, for all we know, Bruce Bochy decides, yeah, I don't want to do it. Okay, so that he's off the list, and then Ron Washington gets uh, goes back to the Rangers. I mean, there's this. Oh well, now we're down to these two. So we'll see, we'll see, and we hope uh, we've provided some information and some context. Shop at Chuck's book. Yes. And Come. Refer me as a friend so I can get the hundred dollar bonus and we could all just bet on his Come book. to Garfine's <laughs> sports book. Yeah, the, the <laughs> that doesn't really sound right. No, we there's no sports we'll, book we'll named after between a between now and the next podcast, we'll figure out a better name. Okay. That's a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Win Trust, your home for White Sox check in with free ATMs nationwide. Go to the special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash socks. Hawk Harrelson, take it away. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over.